scanning for audio. This time there'll be no exciting Torchwood chat, no pointless news section, because let's face it, if it's on the internet you probably already know what it is and you don't need to hear somebody else talk about it. I do, of course, as is tradition, need to thank everyone who's been emailing me of late, still, about my thoughts on Torchwood, and also for the handful of emails I've had about my forthcoming show 100, 100 Tin Dog Podcasts. Who would have thunk it? Of course, I still actually don't know what the theme of episode 100 is going to be, or even if it's going to have one. Tony from the Flashing Blade podcast did suggest that I do Dimensions in Time. I could, but I won't. Let's not subject anyone to that just yet, shall we? Over the last few weeks I've also had another thought, mainly after seeing the nine-minute trailer from Comic-Con for the new Prisoner TV series. As anyone who knows the way I sign off every episode of the TDP... I am, of course, a huge Prisoner fan, so I'm considering doing a secondary podcast, the Prisoner cast, possibly just called Tally Ho. Now, there were only 17 episodes of the original series, so what I was thinking of doing was having myself and another guest discuss each and every episode in full every show. I don't know whether to have that as part of the Tin Dog podcast, because let's face it, It is primarily a Doctor Who Universe podcast. It's also mine, and I do get final say. There is, of course, the other argument, where I could do a Prisoner podcast on the 17 episodes, and then continue when the new series starts. To my knowledge, there isn't another podcast out there on the Prisoner, but I am more than willing to be proven wrong. If you've got any thoughts on this idea, please email me at the usual address. You see, I've rambled once again. Let's stop all this and talk about Terminus. This is your last chance, boy. What did you do to me? You will recover. Nissa, this is Terminus, where all the ladders come to die. For the leather shit! You're all going to die! Terminus is the second story in the Black Guardian boxed set. As I said last time when we were discussing Mordron Undead, I wasn't aware that it was a trilogy. A lot of talk has been made of the way that Turlow's character is only really there in order to try and kill the Doctor, which is true, and it seems to go on and on for a very long time. Now I'll grant you that. It's three stories, four episodes each, that is twelve weeks with one character whose only motivation is to kill the Doctor. It may seem like a long time, but it's only three stories watched back to back. It's more of a character arc, a development, so it doesn't seem as intense now as it did then. So what's the basic story about? Well, it's still the busy TARDIS. We have the fifth Doctor, Vegetable Man. We have Janet Fielding playing Tegan. We have Turlow, Mark Strickson. And this marks the very last Sarah Sutton as Nyssa's story. Peter Davison's never kept any real secrets about his love of the character of Nyssa, how she was primarily a great companion, ideal in the sense that she was clever enough to know some of the solutions, vulnerable enough to require the Doctor's help, and without extra motivation enough, apart from, of course, being in tears about her father, Tremas, but that's for a different time, just to be a great companion. But this marks the end of that time. She'd first joined the crew of the TARDIS, way back at the end of Tom Baker's time, Keeper of Trarkin, of course, and she'd been with the Fifth Doctor for most of his run. Of course, with the odd story where she slept through it, which is a shame, because I think she would have been quite good in that. Again, that's for another time on a different show. 
the basic plot isn't very basic at all. Thanks to some fiddling with some settings, on board the TARDIS by Turlo in an attempt to sabotage the TARDIS on behalf of the Black Guardian, blah, 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 the TARDIS ends up dematerialising partially, only partially, and not where you'd suspect, i.e. it kind of does an emergency materialisation on board another ship. This other ship is apparently deserted, though not quite, and is on his way somewhere, you're not quite sure where. And let's face it, you're listening to this, you know the story. It's full of the futuristic version of the leper colony. Or more precisely, a leper ship on its way to the leper colony, the leper colony being the terminus of the title. Terminus being, of course, Latin for end of the line. Only once at Terminus do things start getting even odder. The futuristic version of leprosy attacks Nyssa, who starts getting extremely hot and starts removing clothing for no adequately explored reason until we come to the commentary. More about that in a moment. And then on board this colony ship, well, there's the possibility of a cure. The cure is administered by one of the single worst Doctor Who special effects of, of all time, the Garn, a large dog monster man thing. It's second perhaps only to, well, I don't even want to say it out loud, but the Candy Man. It's not the writer's fault. The writer had originally envisaged, well, darkness and some red glowing eyes and you never see the monster and we all know how successful that can be in Doctor Who. And we also know how often that really doesn't happen. There is a cure. The cure is a massive amount of radiation, and the source of this radiation is a faulty engine. This faulty engine has been faulty for a very, very, very long time, because the engine in question belonged to an enormous spaceship which was capable of travelling through time. Such was its power source that when it developed a fault, it dumped all of its energy into the time vortex and created the universe. That would be absolutely everything, yeah. But guess what? It's got another fuel source on board. And if you press the wrong button, and you just know someone might. It might, just might, bring about the end of absolutely everything. It sounds exciting. It sounds full of pace. Of course, there are some space pirates. Throw those in as well. Well, let's not. They're the single most 80s thing ever to come out of Doctor Who. They've got Barbarella-style head headgear that you just don't want to think about. And I know Barbarella was from the 60s, but just let that one go, shall we? Another group of characters that I've just not mentioned yet are the people who run the place. They all need a drug called Hydromel. And don't you just know that the person who's never mentioned being a biologist, Nyssa, can make some, because of course she's now a biologist. There are lots and lots and lots of very small holes in this. But don't let that put you off. A rather nice story. Tell you what, if ever you've disliked this story, because I bought it on VHS when it came out, I think I watched it twice and that was about it. No, if you're buying this box set, do me a favour and you know what I'm going to say. Head over to the special features and switch on the new CGI. You see, with this new CGI, the threat to the TARDIS is so much more realistic, if realism can ever be applied to Doctor Who. Extendedly long corridor scenes that you've never seen in the inside of the TARDIS all fit seamlessly. The threat of the encroaching universe seems so much more, well, threatening. But it's not just that. The scale of Terminus, as seen in the CGI, is incredible. The pirate ship and its accompanying mothership all function seamlessly. Even as an experiment, it's well worth seeing this. But as I said earlier, the Garn just didn't quite manage to, well, be CGI'd out. We still have a man in a dog suit. And on this DVD you also have perhaps the most revealing and most enjoyable of Doctor Who commentaries. Apart from one line about Rulalenska, which I'm sure the people at Taki on Tea may or may not be rolling around on the floor about, this is one of the most revealing and, bizarrely, educational of commentaries. You see, they've got the writer, Stephen Gallagher, on board, and this guy is a very, very good author. He is immensely intelligent and very witty. He reveals that the Garn was, of course, named that after the, well, the Norse version of Cerberus, the god, the dog, that guarded the gates of hell. That the design of the guard's armour 
is based on the memento mori, the one that you find in your cathedral, where the three layers of tomb on the top layer, carved in stone, is the knight as he would appear in everyday life. The second layer is the discarded, the third layer is the skeleton, and below that is the actual decaying body. All of those things have been taken as motivation for the creativity that Doctor Who thrives on. As well as fascinating facts, you get some lovely side conversations about how many of the cast actually owned dogs. But as commentaries go, it's really worth listening to. I know I've already mentioned the elephant in the room, being Sarah Sutton removing her skirt for no reason, which is one of the reasons this story is remembered and possibly one of the few things it's remembered for. Ignore that. Because in the original script, Stephen had the idea that Nyssa was still wearing her Victorian Alice in Wonderland-style garb, her sugar plum fairy look, if you prefer, and so she would have pricked her thumb on her brooch, thus allowing the narrative to follow through perfectly. And rather than having to leave the rather large clue of her skirt. Whether this event had any effect on the, how can I put this, emotional development of certain young fans, I'll leave that in the privacy of their own mind. Suffice to say, I preferred Tegan anyway. Sarah Sutton's performance is great. Her farewell scene is one of the better from Classic Who. And there are some tremendously good lines here. Things like when Bo says, I'm not dead, am I? No. Good. I was expecting something better from the afterlife the sort of quotable lines that Classic Who thrives on. And so until next time, I'll leave the Black Guardian trilogy ready for its final instalment, Enlightenment, my all-time favourite Doctor Who story. Before I go, here is a Whostrology reading. For Joel Fairburn, born on the 7th of May 1978, born between season 15 and 16, in the house of the fourth Doctor, with Leela in the Descendant and Ramar and Ramana Varatnalunda on the horizon. Episode shown this day of the Gunfighters, episode 2, and the long game. The Hoostrology. It's time for a new direction. A quest is at hand. Why not take your new and upgraded friends with you? Be careful whose advice you take. It's not all black and white. Just whistle a catchy tune, and be pleased that others are always willing to defend you. Not everyone is cut out for adventure, but that shouldn't stop you having a good time. Sometimes you can't keep the wolf from the door. Watching the news can be a low point, but don't worry, things could always be worse. And with that, I'll say farewell, and speak to you all very soon. Be seeing you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk See?